then we're ready to introduce Bob Pena, and he's going to tell us about integrability and gravitational waves. So please go ahead. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you for organizing this series of talks. Thank you for the invitation to speak, and um, thank you for accommodating me in this virtual format. I, of course, would have much preferred to be there in person, but it was not to be this time. Um, so the first few slides are just going to be review for many people, but they'll help me establish some context for what I want to tell you about. So one of the miracles, really, of classical general relativity is that it admits many exact solutions. Some of the famous examples are the Schwarzschild metric and the Kerr metric, but there's many more. There's whole textbooks full of exact solutions of general relativity. Um, an important example for this talk is the Einstein-Rosen metric, which is an exact solution for a cylindrical gravitational wave. And the reason this is uh, a miracle is because the field equations are nonlinear partial differential equations. And usually, nonlinear partial differential equations don't have any exact solutions. So how is it that general relativity has so many exact solutions? And I don't actually think there's a there's a very there's a there's an overarching explanation that covers every example, but there is a nice explanation that covers at least the examples on the previous slide. So all of the examples on the previous slide have two commuting killing vectors. So you can think of that as two ignorable coordinates. And so if you just look at metrics with two commuting killing vectors, then you're, then you're really just studying a dimensional reduction of general relativity to two space-time dimensions. And if you reduce general relativity to two space-time dimensions, you get a two-dimensional sigma model, actually. So that's quite a bit simpler than general relativity although it's still very complicated, it's still an interacting nonlinear theory. But that sigma model turns out to be classically, at least, integrable, an integrable system. So that story explains why general relativity has so many exact solutions with two commuting killing vectors. Um, and that covers the examples on the previous slide. So the exact black hole solutions I refer to have a, a time translation invariance and a rotational invariance. So those are their two commuting killing vectors. And the cylindrical gravitational wave metrics, well, the two commuting killing vectors just generate the symmetries of the cylinder. So translations along the cylinder and rotations of the cylinder. So this is, um, this is a beautiful story worked out largely in the 1970s, I would say. Um, uh, it doesn't cover every example um, of an exact solution of general relativity. It only seems to work for a zero cosmological constant. And I'm personally a bit confused or ambivalent about why. Is it that there's a generalization to non-zero cosmological constant that we haven't discovered? Or is it something qualitatively different is going on that we need to understand for cases with um, non-zero cosmological constant? Okay. So that this is the sense in which I'll be referring to integrability in this talk. Um, still just giving a little more background about this story. So there are different versions of this story for black holes and cylindrical gravitational waves and cosmological solutions. And each version of the story has a slightly different flavor. 
So I've already mentioned this, but for black holes, the two commuting killing vectors are time and a rotation. And so if you dimensionally reduce general relativity with respect to time and a rotation, you end up with a two-dimensional theory whose coordinates are both, are, are both space coordinates, space-like coordinates. So this, the two-dimensional sigma model that you end up with is in Euclidean signature. Um, in the case of cylindrical gravitational waves, you dimensionally reduce general relativity with respect to a translation along the cylinder in a rotation. And so you end up with the reduced theory is a sigma model in two space-time dimensions, but the coordinates of the two-dimensional space-time, uh, well, there's, there's a time coordinate and a radial coordinate left over. So you end up with a 2D sigma model in Lorentzian signature. And there's another variant of this I won't describe that applies to some cosmological solutions. And um, these different variants of the story are not totally isolated universes. They talk to each other. So they're all um, related. And a striking example of that, I think, is in this paper of Peron, Safier, and Katz from 1986 which I feel is maybe not as well known as it could be. So they showed there's a wick rotation, which maps the Kerr metric, so a spinning black hole, to a cylindrical gravitational pulse wave. So they start with the Kerr metric. They perform this funny wick rotation. You can act, it, maybe I should say two wick rotations. And they end up with this new metric, which is totally real. It's a real metric. Um, and it describes a cylindrical gravitational pulse wave. So this picture is a picture that um, I made of their solution. And it's a good picture to keep in mind for the rest of this talk, because I'm going to talk a lot about cylindrical gravitational waves in this talk. So this is a picture of the solution that they land on. And uh, here's how it goes. The coordinates in this picture are uh, time, t, and this radial coordinate, r. Um, r starts at 0 and then runs out to infinity. And, and time is infinite in both directions. And this thing that I'm making a picture of is some proxy for the energy density in this gravitational wave. And it's concentrated in a pulse with some width uh, in the R direction. I'm not showing the, I, 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 I've suppressed the Z in the phi directions. So this pulse is really localized on a cil an infinite cylinder along the Z direction and around the phi direction, but I'm not showing those directions. So all that's left of the, is this radial coordinate R and if you just look along R at some fixed time, then there's a pulse of energy. And as time passes, the pulse uh, moves to R equals zero, and then it appears to bounce and go back out to R equals infinity. So the, the, the four-dimensional picture is a pulse concentrate on, on a cylinder, and the cylinder is collapsing to zero size. And then you can think of the cylinder as just passing through itself and expanding back out to infinite size. So this is a cylindrical gravitational pulse wave. Um, and, um, and yeah, and, it, and it, so it looks a lot like lumps in, you know, integrable systems with solitons. And I didn't show a picture of it. I probably should have, but you can generalize this um, to multiple lumps. So let me just say in words, there are, there are exact solutions that describe multiple black holes. Um, the black hole solutions have this unphysical feature that the black holes are connected by a con conical defect string. But you can do this pair of wick rotations and convert those black hole metrics into gravitational wave metrics. 
And if there's more than one black hole, you get multiple pulse waves. And um, the pulse waves can scatter through each other. And when they hit each other, they merge together and form some bigger lump. But then they come out looking exactly the same as they went in. So these are sol vacuum solutions of general relativity that describe classical pulse wave scattering. And if and they look just like um, they just look they look just like soliton scattering in conventional uh, integrable systems. In some sense, it's already happening in this picture because when the cylinder shrinks to zero size, it you can think of it. it there's this peak at r equals zero there. You can think of it as passing through itself and interacting with itself and then just coming out the same uh, on the other side. So for me personally, seeing this paper by Peron, Safir, and Katz was very inspiring. Inspired me to do to, to get serious about this subject. Um, and it's also, and, and let me just, yeah, I just think it's quite a remarkable fact. So I'll just say another word about it. This, this wick rotation, um, it, ex you can think of it as exchanging the T and Z coordinates of the Kerr metric. So the imaginary time component, the imaginary time direction of Kerr becomes the Z direction of the pulse wave. In the imaginary z direction of Kerr becomes the time direction of the pulse wave. So not okay. I I should move on. But like one final way to to say this is, you can think of it as there's the Kerr metric, which is a real metric. Real the coordinates are real, and then it has some complexification, where there's four complex coordinates. And so if you think about that complexified metric, the Kerr metric in this cylindrical gravitational pulse wave, I think it's correct to say, are two real slices of that single complex of complex metric. So it's just amazing to me that this cylindrical pulse wave and Kerr are so closely related. They're like two sides of the same coin. And I feel like there's probably some deep physical lessons in this that haven't been appreciated, but that's just a gut feeling. There's probably something more to do with this amazing fact. Okay, but okay, so if, if nothing else, um, please uh, like remember this picture because that's sort of the mental picture for a lot of this talk, these cylindrical pulse wave solutions. And if I was there in person, I would love to take a lot of questions, but I don't know how feasible it is to take questions. Is there any, if anyone has a question and a way to ask it, let me just take a second. Any questions? I can pass on the mic. Comments? There seems to be no questions. Okay. Okay. Let me keep going. It might be easiest at the end anyways. Okay. So I'm going to talk about... Um, cylindrical gravitational waves in this talk. So as I said, at least classically, that means those can be discussed using this two-dimensional sigma model in Lorentzian signature. So when I saw the pictures like the one on this slide, that's a classical, it looks like a classical integral mo model with, with lumps. I um, So a natural question to me seemed, is there a quantum version of this story? Can I quantize this system and write down an S matrix for these lumps? And does it behave like an S matrix of a conventional uh, integrable system? And so that's what this talk is about. Um, the, the black hole case is interesting too, but classically it's a great thing because it gives you all these exact solutions, but that Sigma model and Euclidean signature if you quantize it, I'm less clear. It's less clear to me what what an interesting observable is to calculate. But this uh, cylindrical gravitational wave sigma model, that sigma model is a well-defined 2D quantum field theory, and it has an S matrix. 
And so that's like a clear observable that you can play around with. And you can ask if this classical story extends to that S matrix. And apparently this hasn't really been studied before. Uh, at least that the questions that I'm going to talk about. And so there's a couple like motivations. You can think of this sigma model as an interesting 2D QFT in its own right. You can think of it as a toy model, I, I think, for quantum gravity because its classical solutions describe cylindrical gravitational wave scattering classically. And so how great would it be to have an exactly solvable S matrix if that if that's possible for this model? And if it's not possible, I, I would like to know how close one can get. And then I another motivation that I will throw out there is holography. So as I said, this story is for zero cosmological constant. And there are not too many examples of holographic dualities for theories with zero cosmological constant. There, there's some examples, but it, it would be interesting to have another example. So one motivation, like long term, is to is to find a, a holographic dual for this two-dimensional sigma model. And I'm not going to answer any of the questions on this slide in this talk. Those are the motivations. I'm going to just show some partial results in the direction of the first question. And if you don't care about these questions at all, I'm there's enough in the talk that's like, I think, generally applicable lessons about these sigma models that I hope you'll still enjoy the talk. Um, and uh, so some references, this talk is based on a paper from earlier this year, at least the first half or two thirds of the talk. And then at the end, I'll talk about some results from a paper that I hope will be out in the next couple of weeks. And I should mention, okay, this is a big subject, especially the classical version of this story. This the, the case of cylindrical gravitational waves and studying them quantum mechanically has not been studied too much. But there's some important papers I should mention by Ashtakar and company. Uh, Niedermeyer has written some papers that are probably the most similar to, the, to this talk. There's papers by Barbero et al. Um, studying, studying this problem. And then maybe everyone in this talk has already heard, I mean, about the Garrow group and this classical story it goes back to papers of Garrosh. Uh, Breton Lohner and Mason is a great review paper for the classical story. And Nikolai is also a great review paper for the classical story. Classics. Um, so now let me talk about the Sigma model. And... Um, even if you're only interested in the classical story, the, the next few slides are just a review of the Sigma model. So, so it's just, so that, so this is equally, you know, this is just the classical thing. Mm. So I'm not going to review how this Sigma model is derived, but the way it's derived is by starting with four dimensional vacuum general relativity and dimensionally reducing it with respect to these two killing vectors. It's not totally straightforward. You do some duality redefinitions of the fields. So there's some non-trivial stuff that goes into it. But for the sake of time, let me just um, begin by just telling you the answer. This is the sigma model that you end up with. Um, and so let me walk through this action. It's an action for um, a pair of scalar fields. Uh, X1 and X2, so these two scalar fields. And these encode the two physical polarization states of the four-dimensional graviton. Um, so X1 and X2 are target space coordinates. That's, a, that's how you would think of them as a sigma model. And this thing here, gamma mu nu, is the target space metric. And it turns out that for this problem, the target space metric is the hyperbolic plane. So it's a sigma model whose target space is the hyperbolic plane. Okay, that's that's that. Um, the space-time metric, so A here is a space-time index, of course. 
The space time metric is just, uh, well, it looks just like Minkowski space. The coordinates are time and R, T and R. In that picture of the cylindrical gravitational pulse wave, these are the same T and R coordinates. So the background, spa the space time is just this Minkowski metric. It's very simple. Uh, but I do need to note that um, the R coordinate is positive only. So space is a half line. And the reason for that is go back to four dimensions. You have this cylindrical gravitational wave. You reduce with, with respect to this rotation. So this R is, is this cylindrical radial coordinate. So R equals zero is like the symmetry axis of a cylinder. From the 2D perspective, R equals zero is looks like the left boundary of space-time. So space-time has a left boundary at R equals zero, which again in 4D is the symmetry axis of the cylinder. And a weird property of, well, it's weird the first time you see it, of this story is that it's possible, and I've done it here, to get a two-dimensional action for this sigma model with a fixed metric. So this is a fixed space-time metric. It doesn't fluctuate. Of course, in general relativity, the metric is fluctuating. And x1 and x2 are secretly coming from some components of the four-dimensional metric, and they're fluctuating. But it turns out to be possible when you go through this dimensional reduction to arrange things so that the residual two-dimensional metric is actually fixed. Okay, so so that's that's the action. That's so, and now you can basically, if you want, forget about where this came from in general relativity, and you can just think of this as a two-dimensional quantum field theory, you know, in its own right, or class or field theory or whatever in its own right. It's well defined. Okay, uh, but um, it deserves a couple more comments. So I've said this, it comes from uh, general relativity. The classical solutions of this describe cylindrical gravitational wave scattering. So it's a 2D integrable system. So you can adapt all the techniques from 2D integrable systems, solve the sigma model, and then lift those to cylindrical gravitational wave solutions of general relativity. And the reason it has two scalar fields, x1 and x2, is because a four-dimensional graviton has two polarizations. So those are the two polarizations. Um, OK, there's one other thing in this action that I have to talk about a little bit. The really weird feature of this action is this factor of r here uh, sitting inside the integral. So. That R is the space coordinate. Um, so the fact that that R is there in this way that I've written it, if you look at this way that I've written it, this version of the action, and I'll talk about a different version in a second, but this version of the action doesn't have R translation invariance because it has this explicit factor of R sitting here. This version of the action does have time translation invariance. And so that that's that's quite weird. That's quite weird to have this factor of R here. This fact that it should be there falls out of the dimensional reduction. So your first thought is, I don't like this fact, would probably be, I don't like this factor of R, maybe. And let me talk a little bit about where it comes from without going through the full-blown derivation. So... If you want to get an action with 2D Lorentz invariance, you can replace R with a dilaton field, rho, of TR. And so instead of R, this will be a rho. Uh, it's a field rho, which is, which is what happens at some intermediate stage of the derivation of this action. As you go down from four to three to two dimensions, this dilaton appears. And, but if you started two dimensions and, and go back up, you could say, well, I'll replace that R with this field rho of T of R. And then you, could, you would add a Lagrange multiplier enforcing this constraint. 
and, and that's what happens. It's some intermediate step of the derivation of this action that I've written on the previous slide. Um, you get a dilaton with this that satisfies this equation. And so what I did to get that action on the previous slide is I just solved this constraint by hand. I picked the solution rho equals r, which solves this highlighted equation, and I plugged it into the action. And that's 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 why there's no dilaton here, because I've solved that constraint by hand and plugged back in rho equals r. And I could have been a little more general because this constraint is also solved by rho equals r plus c, where c is a constant. And so these solutions with r plus c are all related by r translations. By picking one of those solutions and not including this whole family of r plus c solutions, that's where I broke translation invariance. Um, and, but the reason I did that is I would like to have the dilaton go to zero at r equals zero. And so that's a boundary condition. And so I would say that it's this boundary condition that breaks the R translation invariance. And I think that boundary condition is quite reasonable when one actually you know, uses this to get classical solutions, one imposes this kind of condition. Um, and I like working with this version of the action despite the factor of R because it's a lot simpler uh, uh, to work with this version of the action. Um, so that is my apology for the factor of R. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to work with this action. But the fact that it has this factor of R and doesn't have R translation invariance is going to appear in a small way later on. So I'm I'm stressing it now. But I welcome people with other thoughts about how to do the stuff I'm about to do, keeping rho in this constraint and not explicitly breaking uh, our translation invariance. Okay. So that was the that was the feature of this sigma model that I think deserved the biggest comment. Um, I would stop and take questions here if it was possible. If anyone wants to shout a question about the Sigma model, but maybe it's familiar to everyone. Uh, seems there are no questions. <laughs> okay, there's nothing new here. You can find variations of this in those review papers that I mentioned. This is the standard classical story. Um, let's see, how are we doing on time? I'll say very quickly that the coupling constant of the Sigma model is root eight G over L where G is the 4D Newton's constant and L is the length of the cylinder. So naively, it looks non-renormalizable. I'm not going to, I'm only going to discuss tree level physics. So I'm not going to discuss that point anymore. You don't see a Lambda in the action I wrote. That's because it's inside the target space metric. Um, in these coordinates, X1 and X2 on target space, this is the target space metric. So that's where Lambda is hiding. Um, the fact that it looks non-renormalizable might make you think it's an, it's this ugly model that we should just, you know, not waste any time thinking about. On the other hand, if you want to think of it as a toy model for gravity, you know, it's, it, it shows it's a non-trivial toy model. Um, another comment that I'm just going to fly by is that hy hyperbolic space is negatively curved and sigma models with negatively curved target spaces are not asymptotically free. So this is um, a not asymptotically free quantum theory, but I'm also not going to say anything more about that either. That's a little beyond the scope of this talk. But it's definitely a non-trivial QFT. It's not some easy QFT. All right, now I want to talk about um, how you quantize this sigma model. And some of what I'm going to say in the next couple slides has overlap with uh, paper, the papers I mentioned earlier, like the papers by Barbero et al. Barbaro at all. So let's let's just you know try to follow textbook QFT and, and quantize it. So the first thing you would do in textbook QFT is write down the free equation of motion 
and look at its solutions. And those will be the modes of the quantum theory. And so the, the free theory, its equation of motion has these uh, two families of solutions where J and Y are Bessel functions of the first and second kind. And, okay, so one, the, the one feature of this that deserves some comment is that the second family of solutions, these Bessel functions of the second kind, those blow up at R equals zero. And so um, I'm not going to include them in the quantum Hilbert space. And other people who've thought about this model made the same choice. So the papers by Barbero et al, where they discuss the quantization of the free theory, I don't think they discuss the interacting theory, but they also make this choice. And so the point of that choice is when you do a mode expansion of these X mu fields, X1 and X2, it looks like the thing on the right-hand side. So the A's are, of course, just the creation and annihilation operators, but you only have J naught. So that's a choice that I'm going to make, and it seems physically reasonable. These Y naughts definitely play no role in like the interesting classical work. Um, they look unphysical. They blow up at the left boundary at R equals zero. So for me, this is the mode expansion of the free theory. So that's sort of the only non-trivial choice that you have to make when you quantize this. Then you can just, you know, use textbook quantum field theory and, um, and, and quantize it. But you make that choice. I, I make that choice. Um, it's an, so it's an interacting quantum field theory. Um, I showed you in the target space metric, there was this factor of e to the two lambda x1, where lambda is the coupling constant, of course. And if you, if you expand that exponential, you get an infinite series of interaction terms. And so in terms of diagrams, uh, this is what those terms look like. Well, this is the first two terms in the infinite series. And the way I've drawn the diagrams is these solid lines are x1 particles. And the dash lines are the X2 particles. And as the dot, as you as you just go on in the series, you just get they, they all kind of look the same. You just get more and more um, solid lines sticking out. And just from expanding this exponential, this the solid line X1s, you just get more and more factors of that. So I'm gonna talk about this theory at uh, tree level. And I'm going to talk about the symmetries of two to two scattering. Well, for two to two tree level scattering, these are the only two interaction terms that you'll ever need. So you just have to remember that this theory has these two interactions plus a bunch more that we don't need for now. Okay. So again, just thinking of the sigma model as a con basic, more or less conventional quantum field theory. So at this point, it's basically straightforward to work out the Feynman rules and compute the S matrix, at tree level at least. And uh, I'll, I'll mention what you what you get, and then I want to, and then I'm going to switch gears and talk about symmetry, and in a in a, in, in a little bit about integrability. Um, but you can think of these particles that I'm scattering as cylindrical right. gravitational waves. Is is there a question there? No. Okay. Hmm. However, before I just uh, show you the answer, there's one piece of the mathematics that is sufficiently pretty that I want to just uh, show it to you. So this next slide is just a math slide. It's a piece of the math that you need to do these amplitude calculations. And I could skip it, but it's just pretty. And so I'm just going to show it to you. But basically, so yeah, so when you compute um, these Feynman diagrams and you have these interactions where you have, you have to integrate, you have to do a lot of integrals over products of Bessel functions. So that won't surprise anyone. And there's beautiful formulas for these integrals. And I'm just going to show you one of them, which maybe some of you are experts in Bessel functions and know these integrals, but I didn't know these integrals. So here's one. This is um, something from the 19th century, Sanin. Here's one of his integrals. Uh, and 
you actually use this over and over and over if you actually go compute these Feynman diagrams. So this is an integral. This is just a mathematical fact. If you do an R integral over the product of three Bessel functions, and they have three different of these K parameters, K1, K2, and K3. So this is like when three particles meet at a three point vertex, you're gonna have to do this integral. Um, then the answer is really simple. And it's actually two cases. So if K1, K2, and K3 can form a triangle, then the answer is one over two pi times the area of that triangle. If K1, K2, and K3 cannot form a triangle, then this integral is zero. So that's just a calculus fact. But I thought, okay, that, I, that, that, that's very, I thought that was a very pretty formula. And um, you actually use this formula over and over again um, every time you have a three-point interaction where three Bessel functions meet at a point. Um, physically, using a formula like this to compute a, a Feynman diagram is pretty weird because uh, normally at a three-point vertex like that, you would enforce momentum conservation and the K of the outgoing particle would just equal the sum of the Ks of the ingoing particles, some of the momenta. The fact that in these calculations, you use this integral is a manifestation of the really weird thing about the action that I stressed earlier on, which is that the action doesn't have our translation invariance. So these K parameters are not really conserved momenta. Um, so when you actually come to the point where you do these integrals, you, you, this is the formula that, that is true. And it's sort of amazing to me, actually, maybe I just don't have enough, enough experience with non-relativistic QFT, but it's sort of amazing to me that this all hangs together and, um, you actually get, you know, you can actually do this. It actually all works out. So, yeah, so this is a formula from the 1800s. Um, now having some physical interpretation in terms of uh, these cylindrical gravitational wave scattering. So anyways, even if you don't care about the rest of the talk, there's, um, there's just a calculus fact that you can enjoy. Um, so I wanted to mention that. Okay, but once you know uh, enough of these uh, Bessel integrals, you can actually just compute these Feynman diagrams and... Um, and, and work out the S matrix of this 2D QFT. And this is the last thing I'll say about that. And then I'll switch to talking about symmetry. So to just give an explicit example, you can work out the tree level amplitude for X1, X1 to X2, X2 scattering. And again, just thinking of this as a normal 2D QFT, there's three different Feynman diagrams. You use the rules of QFT and you get an answer. Um, and I don't care too much about the details of the answer. I just, but the fact that, but the, the point is that now when I talk about symmetry, I can, I can, um, derive conservation laws for the S matrix. And this is just data that I can use to check those S, those, uh, symmetry conservation laws. So this, so the point is I have this data now, and now I'm going to talk about symmetry and then I can, you know, check that the symmetry really is there in this data. So here I go, I'm going to shift gears and talk about symmetry. Um, and uh, yeah, the first part of this discussion will also apply perfectly well to the classical theory. So if you don't care about this weird quantum story, then you can just um, pay attention to the next few slides. So there's two different symmetries in a way that I want to talk about. The first one is pretty obvious. It's a global symmetry of the sigma model. So remember that the target space of this, sig this sigma model, the classical sigma model, whatever, is, is the hyperbolic plane. And the isometry group of the hyperbolic plane is PSL2R. So this sigma model has a global PSL2R symmetry. And that's a well-known fact. 
especially well at least classically in the general relativity that's called the, that symmetry is called the Ehlers group okay um okay in the two of so so the PSL2R is three dimensional two of the three generators are like nonlinear hyperbolic -y versions of sh shift symmetries and just like ordinary shift symmetries they're spontaneously broken in the quantum theory. So, so those aren't very interesting for this talk. They don't give S matrix conservation laws. As an aside, I mean, maybe they give like soft theorems or something, but I haven't thought about that at all. But they, they don't give the kind of S matrix conservation laws that I'm sort of interested in this talk. Okay, so that's just an extra comment you would make if you were thinking about this model quantum mechanically. But the third generator of the Ehlers group is unbroken. Um, and you can think of it as, um, as a rotation that rotates x1 and x2 into each other. So this is an SO2 subgroup of the Ehlers group. And if you look at the free theory, then the Noether charge would be this charge Q that I wrote here, which is just the standard Noether charge for when you have you know, a vector of two fields and you have an SO2 rotation that mixes them. So this sits inside the Ehlers group and is well known in the classical general relativity literature that this symmetry is there of the classical sigma model. And, um, and uh, it's also there in this, uh, in these S matrix elements that I, that I was talking about. So it's also there, at least in the tree level quantum theory and um, I'm not I'm not going to go through the details, but you can work out the S matrix conservation law the way you would for any S matrix symmetry and derive some predictions. And then you can go look at the amplitudes I was telling you about, and you can check those predictions. And um, I've written at the bottom like a, a striking way of seeing one of those predictions of this SO2 symmetry. You can compute these three amplitudes the amplitude sigma one for the one one here is x1 x1 and the two two is x2 x2 so that's the amplitude that i told already told you about you can compute these two other amplitudes and you can check that this so2 symmetry implies that the sum of those three is the amplitude for x1 x1 to x1 x1 scattering and actually if you look at the interaction vertices that i showed you this theory has no diagrams for such an amplitude. So the right-hand side is zero. So you could just, you, you can, and I, so this is one of the things I did in that paper from earlier this year, is I computed these three amplitudes just using Feynman diagrams. And then I checked that they sum to zero. So that's just an explicit way of seeing this um, Ehlers SO2 symmetry in this S matrix. So this is an unbroken tree level symmetry. Okay, so that's that's the Ehlers group. Uh, that's what the Ehlers group is all about. And that's all I want to say about that. So again, in the classical theory, the Ehlers group is sitting inside this much larger group called the Garrosh group, or the Garrosh group. The Garrosh group is a, is a hidden symmetry. It's an infinite dimensional catch Moody symmetry of the sigma model. And the fact that the Garrosh group exists explains why the sigma model is an integrable system. So in some sense, the existence of the Garrosh group explains why the Kerr metric exists in these other exact solutions with two commuting killing vectors. So the Garrosh group is the really interesting symmetry that makes the sigma model interesting. And um, yeah, uh, so, so this is all well known classically. And so the, the motivation for the last few slides is, can you see any signs of the Garrosh group in this S matrix? Can you see, could somebody who just knew about this S matrix also sort of see the Garrosh group in it? And my initial motivation for thinking about this problem was, uh, you know, I had looked fondly at the, at you know, the wonderful things that were were being done with the BMS group. 
So the, here's the BMS group, which is a totally different symmetry in general relativity. But the BMS group was basically this obscure thing that only hardcore general relativists cared about up until 10 years ago, until you know Andy Strominger asked the question, if you can see the BMS group in the S matrix, and then he told us all this wonderful story about soft theorems. So like the BMS group 10 years ago, the Garrosh group is sort of this obscure group that only hardcore relativists care about. And it just seemed to me interesting to ask if you if there's a, if there is an S matrix in which you can see the Garrosh group in some way. So a quantum version of this old sort of obscure classical story. And the answer is uh, yes, uh, at least at tree level, which is all I'm doing. And the, this part of the talk is not published yet, but I hope the paper will be out in a few weeks. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so you, it seems that the, the model is integrable in some sense, and in one of the characterization of integral models, there is no particle production in the yes. basis. And there, there is an argument in the relativistic case that if you impose the condition that there is no particle production in general, that highly constrains the interaction coefficients of the interaction vertex to all orders, which determines the simplest model. For example, if you have a for example one scalar model, you get the, like a sine Gordon, for example. Yes. So that determines the interaction terms to all orders. So is it what's happening here? You have a, it should, just by imposing the condition that there's no particle production, that should constrain the interaction term very strongly. That's a great question. And I don't know the answer. Um, all I know is that it's very easy. And this is in my paper that is published. Uh, so I talked about two to two scattering. In that paper, I did something which is maybe too trivial to be interesting, but I briefly noted that there all of the amplitudes for uh, all of the three point amplitudes, so like one to two scattering or two to one scattering, all of those amplitudes vanish. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely no particle production at three points, although that's that's usually just true tr for trivial reasons. The interesting case is at five points, and I started to check it, but I haven't finished checking just directly checking whether there is particle prediction production at five points, like so two to three scattering. I I, I actually just don't know. I, I see, I see. Yeah, it'd be nice to check, but also it it should determine the. I mean, the like, yeah, the, I see what you're saying. You could just assume it's true and see if it Im implies you know the structure of the sigma model. Yeah, uh, that's right. And then maybe you can classify what type of sigma models you can ex interactions you expect, and then. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You could just assume it's true and then see and then work out the consequences. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. So just a few slides to go. Oh, um, yeah. So this this part of the talk is going to closely follow um, the analogous thing for the two-dimensional ON sigma model, which is a classic, famous, celebrated example of a 2D integrable quantum field theory. And um, in particular, there's this paper of Lucher and Paul Meyer from 1978, where they work out non-local conserved charges for this sigma model. And I'm just going to adapt basically their arguments to this slightly weird sigma model. And uh, let me, there's a few steps. So the first step, is, uh, well, the way I wrote the sigma model before in terms of x1 and x2 is not ideal um, for this part of the talk. So here's a comment. The hyperbolic plane is the same thing as PSL2R mod SO2. So instead of working with x1 and x2 directly, you can make your basic field of the sigma model be a matrix valued field. So a PSL2R valued field Although we really want to be in PSL2R mod SO2. And so one way to do that is say that this PSL2R matrix is uh, symmetric. Okay, so that, that becomes the basic field of the sigma model. And there's a way of relating it to X1 and X2 that I won't bother writing down. But it's equivalent to the formulation in terms of X1 and X2. But it's more compact, which makes it better for, for, for the present discussion. 
Okay, M doesn't show up in the action directly. You want the infinitesimal version of M, this field A. So that's M inverse DM. And then you can write the action in this very compact way as the trace of A squared. And um, okay, so that's, an, that's just another way of writing the action. And the point is, um, I'm going to have this variable A from now on. So you're going to see A's everywhere. And that's what A is. It's this other way of writing the fields of the sigma model. So this sigma model has a linear system um, because, because it's classically integrable. And so this is, of course, well known. This is, the in, this is the linear system for this sigma model. And here it is. So this new function u is valued in PSL2R. Here's A, the field from the previous slide. This parameter tau is the spectral parameter. And the, the consistency conditions for the linear system are equivalent to the equations of motion of the sigma model. And I won't review what those words mean because this is a conference on integrability and that's standard integrability stuff. So the fact that this linear system exists implies that the classical sigma model is integrable. And I'm gonna use this linear system to get out the expressions for the non-local charges. This parameter tau is the spectral parameter. And the weirdest thing about this this linear system is that tau is itself space-time dependent. So tau varies as you move around in uh, space-time. But if you like, you could replace tau with a constant spectral parameter, w, so here's w, but the relationship between tau and w is a little, little complicated. So this is the relationship. And again, this is all in those classic review papers I mentioned from the 70s and 80s about uh, this classical sigma model. So this is some beautiful stuff people worked out back then. And um, the reason that you need a space-time dependent spectral parameter has to do with that weird factor of R in the action. Um, so this is, so yeah, I mean, conventional... The most vanilla integrable systems don't need a space-time dependent spectral parameter, but we do because of that factor of R in the action. Okay, so now I wanna quickly get to the charges. Um, you can expand tau in powers of W, the constant spectral parameter. This potential U, you can also expand it in powers of W. So that's what these things are, U1, U2, you get these uh, these things, which are the coefficients in this expansion, expanding in powers of W, the constant spectral parameter. And then you can go back to the linear system and you can expand that in powers of W and you get differential equations for each of these UNs. And then the reason that you get conserved charges is that you look at the right-hand side and you ask if it's zero. And if the right-hand side is zero, then you have a conserved charge because the time derivative of U1 will be zero. Um, uh, I, mean, in, I mean, more precisely, you ask, is the right-hand side zero at R equals infinity? And then you take the value of UN at R equals infinity to be the conserved charge. That's the, that's the idea. If the right-hand side is zero at R equals infinity, then the value of UN at r equals infinity is the conserved charge. So that's the Lucier polymer recipe. So you can walk through these and I impose some boundary conditions, which I think are totally reasonable boundary conditions on how the field falls off at r equals infinity. And these are boundary conditions that are satisfied by standard solutions. So, and if, so with these standard boundary conditions, the right-hand side of, this first equation is zero at the boundary. So U1 at the boundary is a conserved charge. And the right-hand side of the second equation is also zero at R equals infinity. So U2 evaluated at R equals infinity is a conserved charge. Uh, but then this actually stops. So for the ON sigma model, this keeps going and you get an infinite tower of non-local conserved charges. But for this sigma model, you actually, uh, 
you exhaust every possibility after the first two because the right-hand side of the third equation is not zero at r equals infinity. So this u3 is, is not a conserved charge. But the first two are. So you do get two conserved charges, u1 and u2 evaluated at r equals infinity. In the first one, u1 evaluated at r equals infinity, you can solve for this and work out what it is. And this is just the generator of the Ehlers group. So that's great. So this sort of roundabout way of getting at the conserved charges, the first thing in the the first thing you get is you get back the Ehlers group that I already talked about, the sort of obvious global symmetry of the sigma model. But then I mentioned you also get this uh, new charge. So you get another conserved charge. Uh, Q2, which is the value of U2 evaluated R equals infinity, and you can work out what it is. It's quite a bit more complicated. You would never like guess this uh, expression. And it's it has the very strange feature that it has U1 itself as a function of R sitting in here, and U1 was an R integral. So this is a non-local charge. The fact that U1 is here means a non-local charge. So it's coming from a hidden symmetry. This is, doesn't come from a local symmetry of the action. So it's a very weird symmetry, but it's the kind of symmetry that you only find in integrable systems. So this charge, I haven't talked about yet. This charge is a manifestation of the Garrosh group. Okay, so this charge is coming from the Garrosh symmetry. And it is conserved. Okay, so... I have to make one other comment. The charge itself, this Q2, everything on the right-hand side is valued in, in, uh, in SL2R. So there's really three charges, but two of them are basically like some very weird non-local shift symmetries, and they're spontaneously broken after you quantize. So they don't give interesting S-matrix conservation laws for this talk, but... As in the Ehlers case, there's a third component along SO2. And I'm calling that component of Q2 uh, this curly Q. And so here it is again. It's just the third component of the previous charge. And this really is conserved. And it's not broken in the quantum theory at tree level. And it's non-local because it has this U1 integral inside the other integral. So it's an integral of an integral over space. So it's a weird non-local charge. And so it implies conservation laws for the S matrix, but I've told you how to compute the S matrix. So that's just some data and you can go check, you can get the prediction out and then you can check. And that's what's in this paper that hasn't appeared yet, but hopefully will in a couple of weeks. And so these are the predictions for these S matrix elements, sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three are the S matrix elements I was talking about earlier. And the, existence of this charge implies these conservation laws, which you can go look at the data and you can just check that, yes, these really are true. And the fact that it's this weird non-local charge coming from the Garrosh group shows up in the fact that um, it's a you get these differential identities involving um, not just sums and multiples of momenta, but derivatives with respect to the momentum. So, the punchline is that you can see the Garrosh group in the S matrix, at least at tree level. Of course, the big question for the future is whether there's anomalies or whether it's really a true quantum symmetry, you know, at loop level. So that's the end of the talk. The question for the future is whether, well, one question is whether things are there at loop level. Is there an exact S matrix? Um, and an intermediate question is, you know, I was com I computed S matrix elements using diagrams, and then I just checked the symmetries. But ideally, you would like to have understand the symmetry well enough to just fix the S matrix purely using symmetry. And the two conservation laws that I talked about for the local charge and the non-local charge probably are not enough because there's three independent components of the S matrix, three functions and you have two equations. So you probably need a third equation, and the third equation, based on you know, experience with other sigma models, is probably you know, unitarity. So that's, that's what's left to do. Basically, a lot is left to do. But the, the question is, 
does this have, you can, an interesting question is, does this have an exact S matrix? And if not, you know, why not? And another interesting direction, maybe of more broad interest is, does this thing that I've just described have a holographic dual? Because if it is, that would be holographic duality with zero cosmological constant, which seems to me, you know, I, I don't really have a great read of the community, but it seems to me that that would be, that would be uh, of interest to some people. So that's the whole talk. And I'm sorry I'm not there in per person. I really wish I was. This is my email address. And I would love uh, if anyone wants to reach out with comments or questions or ideas of things to do. So thank you very much for listening to me in this digital format. So oh, thanks for the nice talk. Are there any other? Yeah. I have a question concerning your um, Paul Meyer charges. Mm -hmm. in, in what way, or are they related to the conserved to the conserved currents, which uh, Nikolai? Um, well, I mean, what is the relation of the Paul Meyer charges or the currents you exhibited? with those that Nikolai uh, gave in his 91 paper, which goes something like, you take your U, you take uh, an omega or a derivative with respect to one over omega, you multiply it with U inverse, you then hit it with a space-time uh, derivative and possibly a hot star dual. So you get a, a set, an, in, an infinite set of conserved currents how are yours related to Nikolai's conserved currents? Because he, he would say that, well, he, he would appear to have infinitely many such conserved currents. Have you checked that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Thank you. I have not checked that, but I'm interested in that question. Um, there's another nice paper um, by Karatkin and Samlitbin um, working out conser the, the conserved Nerther charges for um for this sigma model and they computed Poisson brackets of the conserved charges to figure out what the algebra is. And I've and the so the short answer is that the relationship between my charges and those charges, which I think are equivalent to Nikolai's charges, is not completely obvious. It's not just you, you don't just look at it and they don't they don't just look exactly the same. So there's but they're both coming from the Garrosh group, I believe. So there's some relationship, but it's a little non-trivial. And I, I actually haven't worked it out. So I would love I would love to know the answer to that, but I don't. Thanks. Any other question or comment? So so the charts, non-local charge uh, you found, uh, do you expect some, it's related to something like a VMS where associates the like a simple symmetry group or some variant there all or could you repeat the last part related to BMS in in what sense? At infinity at the, there there is a asymptotic symmetry group for example in the charges oh. is that is that the is that the explanation of why it exists or yeah let's see is is it something associated with asymptotic infinity or is it something more like uh Oh, okay. There is no horizon, but uh, oh, so do you, do you have an intuition of what type of charges it is physically? That is also a great question. I love. I like that question. Um, so uh, I also don't know the answer, though. Um, let me just say a couple comments of things that I would like to know. So I've computed the charges, but I haven't actually computed the commutators of the charges. So I don't know what algebra these charges form. Classically, they it's probably something like the Garrosh algebra. Um, but the, in the quantum theory, that probably gets deformed into some kind of Yangian symmetry. But an, one question is just, you know, what, it, what algebra do these charges make uh, when you take their commutators? In that paper I mentioned by Krotkin and Sam Litvin does that for for some related looking charges semi classically with Poisson brackets, so that's one question. But yeah, then another question is um, exactly like you said. I don't 
know much, I don't have much to say about the asymptotic symmetries of the sigma model. Um, yeah, it would be very interesting to figure out the best boundary conditions at infinity and work out the asymptotic symmetries. Uh, the asymptotic, I don't, I think the asymptotic symmetry group is a different symmetry group because I don't see how you'd see these non-local charges as asymptotic symmetries. But it would be interesting to work out part of, I, I mentioned part of the motivation is the holograph. It would be interesting to find the holographic dual of this sigma model. And if I, if, if I, yeah, so if you were thinking about that problem, then maybe one of the first steps is you would work out the asymptotic symmetry group because that would help you understand, you know, what the boundary action should be. But to me, it, it's not clear that the, the, the Garrosh group and the asymptotic symmetry group of this theory, to me, seem like they are, they're probably two different groups. I see, I see. Well, probably the short question is then, uh, mathematically, what is the Garrosh group? So is it the non-compact Lie algebra or some Lie algebra? Or, because yeah, it's, it's, an, it's easy to kind of guess what the quantization is. Yeah, at the Lie algebra level, it's a it's an SL2R catch Moody algebra. I see, I see, I see. Uh -huh. So the SL2R Ehlers group gets enhanced to the SL2R catch Moody algebra. That's classically. Karatkin and Samlitbin computed Poisson brackets of charges and argued that after quantization, it's deformed into a Yangian. And so if you want to see the Yangian that they found, you can look in their paper. And if and if and if I'm not pronouncing that well, I apologize for making you do I mean the the reference to their paper is in my paper or I can email it to you if you email me okay I think in the interest of time we should finish here so thanks a lot for the talk let's thank the speaker again okay thank you very much thanks everybody